I'm excited about what we're going to do today, or the beginning of what we're going to do today, in that uh, we're, every fifth Sunday, your board has decided that we are going to have someone else speak, and we're beginning with some of our elders, and when we brought it up, John volunteered like that, and uh, he's had second thoughts since then. No. <laughs> and, uh, but, but, you know, the Word of God is, uh, the word of God is what, what we're here to hear. And uh, no matter who delivers it, and uh, I'm just excited that uh, that this is a, a direction we're going, and uh, and so I, will, John Bryan is going to come and share with us at this uh, time. Good morning. I don't know if I'd say I was overly eager, but um, but yet at the same time. I admit, one of the things that I realize, and I talked to the group of men a while back about a little bit of a spiritual journey that I've been on, because I realize so much of my life, there's been a struggle, and, um, but, ever since you were just walking, what was the one thing that you always wanted to be? Beautiful princess. Am I right? <laughs> Am I right? And even the swan from the ugly ducklings, everybody just wanted to be that, you wanted to be that beautiful princess. You wanted to, and to this day, I, it reminds me of my grandma when she would go to church and my grandma, she was like four, eight, ordinary as can be, but when she went to church, to the day she couldn't do it anymore, she dyed her hair, she had the lipstick on, she dressed up for church, she just wanted to present herself as a beautiful person, even at 90 some years old. And it's just something that always amazed me because that's instilled in her. Now men, ever since you were little, what was one thing that you wanted to be? A hero. Am I right? You can deny it all you want. But you wanted to be that knight in shining armor. You wanted to be this hero. You wanted somebody to be able to come to you and say, boy, you're strong. You're tough. You can handle this. And I realize that there's also the other side that we have this fear as men. Are we going to be good enough? And that kind of holds us back sometimes if we're not careful because we know that we have a lot of ability, but a lot of people compare us to other men. There are some people out there that make crazy good money. They've got beautiful houses. They've got all the cars. They seem like they have everything perfect. Facebook is annoying to me about that because we have this beautiful picture of how perfect everybody's life is. And it reminds me of this week a little bit perfection. Christy even told me she doesn't even know if she ever wants me to do this again because from Monday through the rest of the week broke the drive shaft on the van. Claire's playing tag with another car. She got in a little bit of a bumper. Um, our refrigerator, our refrigerator broke. Our dishwasher broke. And then the final was that yesterday Chris and I had a little disagreement. I'm putting it nicely because we just flat out had an argument. And I realized at that time that Satan was at work. But then I also thought about something. Either Satan was at work, didn't want you guys to hear this, or God just says, you know what, I really don't want you talking. So either one. <laughs> but <laughs> but on, the, on the serious side, I think about we always want to be those heroes. And as a young man, I looked up to a lot of people. And I think about a couple men in my life that I was able to look up to. And I look at, um, you guys have heard me talk about Jack Link. Paul and, uh, knew him. But Jack Link went to our church growing up in Sugar Grove. And one thing about Jack Link is when he was 14, um, he shot his arm. Climbed over a fence, the hammer caught the fence, shot his arm, and he ended up losing his arm right here. And one thing about Jack is he just, he had a sense of humor about him, but yet um, there was nothing that man couldn't do. He, he had to switch the throttle to the left side, but he set the motorcycle up to drive. 
he sat there and put a ring on his chainsaw so he can cut wood. Um, there wasn't anything that if he set his mind to it, his fishing pole. That's very important to me. He said real with that stub. He made no excuses. He did, if he set his mind to it, he said, you know what, I'm going to accomplish this. And that's one thing I always admired about Jack, was that there was nothing. I mean, and even the shotgun, or seeing him shoot, I, I just, the, he was an amazing shot. And, and he was very good friends with Ron growing up, Ron English. And one thing is, I look back at him and I, I see the toughness of him. I remember splitting wood. My brothers and I, we split a lot of wood. That's what we heated with. So I could split wood with the best of them. And I thought, you know, I'm going to be cocky. We're out there splitting a big, gnarly piece of wood. And Jack comes and goes, let's, let's see who can split the fastest. Yeah, he outsplit me. <laughs> he outsplit me. And then there was another man that uh, you guys have heard me talk about, my friend from Canada. And Louis was, he was actually going to be a um, missionary pilot, but changed his plans. But yet, Louis was one of the toughest guys I ever met in my life. Um, I mean, I, I, in high school, we were doing some stuff up uh, at, at his cabin, and he told me to pick up the dock and set, so we could set this up on the slabs so he can support it. Couldn't budget. Louis walks over, picks it up, sets it on there, and I'm going, I mean, at that point, I could lift a lot of weight, and I still couldn't accomplish what Louie did. But yet, Louie, he was a big-time hunter, something I've always loved. He likes to fish. He flies planes. He, everything he enjoyed is stuff that, as a man, I enjoy doing. And I always admired these two guys, but then it's, it hit me a few years ago. Some of you might remember, but some of you don't. There was a man that um, we brought here for just to give a brief testimony from the power team. His name was Bill. And Bill was somebody that, as a young person, he came from a very abusive family situation, and he witnessed his dad behind the couch kill his mom. And was visiting, and because out of conviction by somebody else saying, you have to forgive him once he accepted Christ. And so he started sharing Christ with his dad. And he was able to lead his dad to Christ and became best friends with his dad at that time. And, but one of the things that the love that these men showed is what got my attention. As tough as they were, as, as masculine as they were, their love for the Lord, their love for their families, their love for their children, their love for the community, shine the most. And that's something that got my attention because I always think, well, man, man's a man. But you're not, that's, that's, that's yes, in the world's eyes, that's attributes of a man, but what really makes a man a man? And it really caught me off guard because we think age. Now, I know a lot of men that are teenagers. And I know a lot of boys that are old. That's one of the reasons why, ladies, please don't shut this out, okay? Because one of the things I want to encourage you is, as you listen to this, pray for your man. Pray for your man to grow. Pray for your, if you have a brother, father, wherever this falls, pray for them to lead you lead the family in a godly manner. Because as I talked to the men in the group before, this has been a challenge that I've been growing up because you know, ever since I was little, I hated school. I absolutely hated school. So where did I usually sit? In the very back of the classroom, begging not to be called on. Because even to this day, I hate being called on. I still don't like it because it's, my, it's some insecurities that I've gone through. But one of the things that too, all these, as I look at Jack and Louie, is that not only were they invested in their family, but they also took time to invest in me. I remember coming back um, a week or so after my mom's death, we just got done through the funerals, and we're walking back this back, Jesse, remember this, where the pastor's office is, where there was a hall going back. And I'm going back to the, do something, and Jack steps out of the pastor's office, and he goes, hey, how you doing? And he puts that stub, which I'm, it, it was kind of weird, but he puts that stub around my ar uh, shoulders. And he said, you know what? You'll be okay. Okay. 
And from that day on, Jack and Beth was one of the greatest things because I saw how somebody that was within my church from that day on saw him investing in me. And that was something that I'll never forget. He took me coyote hunting. He took me, did so many different things. But I remember one time I was, But because we deep down inside, we don't, we struggle. Are we going to meet up to what my hopes are, what other people are expecting of me? Um, because our society, one thing I will say is we're struggling to take boys to, to being a man. And that's where my struggle is. I want to read this at, and say, um, it says, it says, boys, take. Men, give. Boys, do things if it feels good. Boy, men, I want to do it because it's right. Boys, self-indulgence. Men, sacrificial love. Boys are passive. Men, Show up. Boys consume. Men produce. Boys are born. Men are made. Boys give in to anger. Men find the paths to peace. Boys, life is about Him. Men, boys, talk down to. Men, speak life into. One of the things that a few years ago, I was eavesdropping of a conversation here at church. I'm not giving names. But one of my favorite conversations, because I wasn't the one being targeted. Because it was a conversation about Sunday school. It was a conversation because it's so hard to get up and get to study school, and it's such a struggle. And this person, being a female, an older person with experience, looked at him straight in the face, and I'm telling you what, I was so glad I wasn't the one receiving it because it convicted me probably more than did them because he, she said, it is your job as the man of the house to make sure it happens. And I felt convicted because we can make every day happen. We can make all the sports events happen. But for she spoke life into him. She spoke life. And to this day, I, I've seen so much change because she, as an experienced person, took the moment and said, hey, I want to speak into you because I believe in you, and I want to see you, um, I want to see you grow. And so um, there was one thing I wanted Randy to show, and then we're going to continue then. He's one. That's why women want him. A good man loves his woman, he loves his children, and they see it in his actions. He's not just a talker, he backs it up with his actions. A good man is wise, he's smart, and he's just, and no matter how many times he falls, he rises back up. A good man is kind, and don't get it twisted. He's considerate, he's helpful, he's a giver, not gullible. A good man knows that God is his source, that's why you can't keep him down. A good man can be disappointed, but he won't allow it to defeat him. A good man is faithful, 
and he'll always be there. So to all the good men out there, I love you, brothers. Believe that. I saw that a while back, and I, I just, to me, I enjoyed it because it was a challenge for me to, what kind of man am I? What kind of man am I being um, with my family? And what am I doing to challenge them? Because of all the things that I can encourage them in, their spiritual walk is the first and foremost thing. And I, if you guys, Genesis 3, 1 through 6, because one of the things that I have always struggled with is being a passive man. I've always struggled with that because I don't want to fail. People are going to look down on me. And one of the things that I, I appreciate, I've been, I, there's a man named Jordan Peterson, and he says, but at least you've tried. You're pushing yourself to make that next step, and you're further then after you've tried than if you never tried at all. And one of the things that, and so I'm going to read through. Now the serpent was more cunning. Woman, has God indeed said, you shall not eat of every tree of the garden? And the woman said to the serpent, we may eat of the fruit of the trees of the garden, but of the fruit of the tree, which is in the midst of the garden, God said, you shall not eat of it, nor shall you touch it, lest you die. And then the serpent said to the woman, you will not surely die, for God knows that in the days you eat of your, your eyes will be open, and you will be like God, knowing good and evil. So when the woman saw that the tree was good for food, and it was pleasant to the eyes, and a tree desirable to make one wise, she took of his fruit, She also gave it to her husband that was with her, and he ate. Who was the reason for the fall? Was it really the aggressive woman, or was it the passive man? Who was it told to? And that's one thing I want you guys to, this is the picture that I struggle with, because I've always kind of had the assumption that, not really reading closely, is Eve had to take the apple after having this discussion with Satan, and going and looking for Adam, and here take apple. What happened? Adam stood there. Adam was just there. Instead of arguing with somebody that is not God. He didn't do that. He just stood there. And then I want us to jump over um, to 1 Samuel 17. And I apologize if I'm yelling quiet or whatever. Please tell me because my ears are full, so I'm having a hard time. I, I don't hear real well. In 1 Samuel 17, what, this is, as a boy, ever since I was a child, this is always one of my favorite passages because David and Goliath is always, as a boy, I kind of going back to that hero thing. We always want to be that hero, but yet there's a side where we're a little bit cautious, but um, I want to paint a little picture for you here, okay? David's dad, hey, your brothers are in battle against the Philistines. Take this, take this to bread to the, your brothers and take, I think it was the cheese to, uh, take some other stuff to the captain of the armies. Kind of try to encourage them a little bit. And so David takes the stuff in. And as David goes in and, and comes up to the battle scene, expecting to see swords flying, seeing things going on, that's not what's going on. He hears Goliath over here, a bunch of cowards, come out and face me like a man. Come out, come out, come out. And in verse 24, this is what I want you guys to see here because I realize so much of my life has been this. And all the men of Israel, when they saw the man, fled from him and were dreadfully afraid. Because, you know what? We are taught to how to do our jobs, right? We have had training to do our jobs. 
We have, had, we have schooling to take us and prepare us for our jobs or, or people on the jobs. But how often do we realize, for me, have I really put myself in a situation where I'm being taught how to be a father or how to be a husband, how to be a man of God? And that's one of the things, I admit, one of the most valuable things you'll ever have in your life is this building right here. Because I know that I shadow doubt. Pastor Jeff, Joel, Pastor Joel, the word of God is very crucial to them and making sure it's brought to us right. And that's something I value very much. And, but the, the men are terrified. Men, you guys saw the title. Courage is being scared to death, but you saddle up anyways. It's being terrified, having to come in the doors. We may not know the scripture as well as the other person. We may not have the education that some people have, but what we do have and what we do know, saddle up. Bring it to the house. Teach it to your children. And we're going to get to that a little bit later, so I'm not going to expand on that too much. But I just, that it just, this bothers me because I realize, because, you know, this morning Jason was talking about some of the things that he's going to discuss in his Sunday school class. And one of the things I struggle with is I do believe we are in our situation in our countries right now because of past. Men. I'm just calling for what I see. Because everyone knows that, right? Number two, how much of this stuff are we just standing and watching exist and happen? And I'm saying that for myself too. We are just existing. We are existing in our jobs. We're competing with how great our stuff is, and, but we're fearful on the things that matter. Are you a spiritual leader in your house? Um, okay, then jump down to verse 26. And this is the part that I find kind of ironic because David, 16 to 19 years old, Coming into this situation here, he was young. And it says in verse 26 of chapter 17, Then David spoke to the men who stood by him, saying, What shall be done for the man who kills this Philistine? That he should defy the armies of the living God. I want you to understand something. The prior chapter, David was already anointed. Okay, so I want you to see this here. David wasn't asking because he was wanting the reward. And this is something that caught me off guard because we always want that reward, reward and stuff. But David, I believe, was saying, guys, number one, isn't there a reward for facing this man? You're here as warriors. Why are you not going out there? There's a reward. But then I want you guys to see the very last. He is defying the armies of the living God. Is that are we allowing to happen? Are we afraid to tell the truth? Are we afraid to say, no, this is, this is what the Bible says? And I realized how valuable it is because David was just previously and he wanted somebody that could play musical instrument. And so Saul already knew David because one of the servants already heard David's reputation and they called him in because he was a man of... Um, I'll, I can never say this right. Val cool. Now you know why. But one of the things about it is he was very passionate about being able to do what he wanted to do. And, and he, there was nothing that held him back. When he knew it was the right thing, he already had that reputation before this even happened.
myself with people that is going to speak the truth to me when I need to hear it. Just like David's telling the other soldiers, no, we're not giving in. Don't you have a purpose for being here today? We have a purpose because this fool is denying my God. And that's something that I realize that so often my insecurities pull me off to myself. I pull myself away from other people because when, when it's uncomfortable, I tend to pull away. That's one of the things as men, we, I, you might want to deny it, but it's true. We tend to pull ourselves away when it's, when it's hard. I'm gonna, I've got an illustration here that I always find was kind of fascinating because God's math isn't our math. A Belgian horse, one of the most powerful, it's a powerful, powerful horse, the strongest, powerful. Horse, can pull about 4,000 pounds. And that to me is just hard to believe because that's a lot of weight. But two Belgian horses, no, it's not 8,000 pounds. But working together, it becomes 16,000 pounds. And that to me just, God, really? I mean, my math doesn't understand that. But then the crazy thing about it is, if you put two horses together in the same stall that are, that are spending time together, and really, quite frankly, getting to know each other, just they're, they're, they're a team. Those two horses have been known to jump up to 32,000 pounds. But the coolest thing here is two brothers, two brothers that were raised together, 52,000 pounds had the ability to pull. And I'm gonna be very honest with you, one of my biggest pet peeves about this whole COVID thing is the destruction of the unity. We pulled apart. Everybody kind of pulled away and we were fearful. Everybody had some kind of fear one way or another. But that made me frustrated because God called us for what? To be together. The strength, the team. You don't see a football player going out there and successful as one person, but it takes the team. I mean, the quarterback a lot of times gets the praise. I, I think about like Walter Payton. He was known for him being an incredible running back, but how good would he have been if it wasn't for the rest of the team that there's some blockers, there's some. That is so much value because David, what he contributed, trying to get the morale of the, um, the army back together, and they just weren't quite catching on, were they? And, um, and then you jump down to verse 33. And this is, you know, you, you sit there, and I, I read this, and David's questioning. David's brother gets annoyed because the sheep... You're the little brother. Get, trying to get him to doubt himself. But if you jump down to verse 33, and Saul said to David, you're not able to go against this Philistine to fight with him. You are just a youth and a man of war. Uh, and, this, and he is a man of war from his youth. And David said to Saul, you're, um, well, here, let me back up. I don't want to jump up there too far. Because that's one of the things I want you to see. The world is getting us to question ourselves. We... You know what, be, being, being a man, that's not loving. Being a man, it, that's not true. Because being a man, is, it goes in deeper than that. And I, I, I don't question yourself if you're living according to the word of God. But even sometimes our own people, if we're not careful, we kind of erode the foundations away instead of encouraging others to grow. We're here together for a purpose. And, and then if you jump down to verse 34 through, the, um, through verse 37, it, David said to Saul, your servant used to keep his father's sheep, and when a lion or bear came and took the lamb out of the flock, I went out after it and struck it and delivered the lamb from its mouth. And when it arose against me, I caught it by its beard and struck it and killed it. Your servant has killed both lion and bear, 
And this uncircumcised Philistine will be like one of them, seeing he has defied the armies. Do you catch that last part again? Of the living God. You know, what I find fascinating is, I mean, I bear hunted, and I mean, and even that 250-pound bear laying there, was still intimidating. I was pretty cautious walking up to the bear. I admit it. And I, one of the things, I, I, I was saving this till now. Bear, Louie was out bear hunting, or trapping, um, up in Canada. He was running the trap line. And the bear was pushing 600 pounds. Big bear, big black bear. And as he's running, he has those 30-30 Winchester, 30-30, and he's walking along. And this, it, it was an odd time of year, but it was a warmer um, and so the bear was out of hibernation temporarily, probably a little hungry, and saw Louie and thought, hmm, buffet. And so he, he stood up and charged Louie. And Louie unloaded his 30-30 com- completely. I, and it it's still kind of makes me, I mean, really, this charging Louie coming right at him unloads the gun. The bear drops at his feet. And this is a full-grown man that I believe is one of the toughest guys I ever met in my life. And he went to his knees. And he said he just thanked God for just giving him another day because he thought he was another. Look at David here. David didn't have a 30-30, okay? He had the staff, um, his um, slingshot, different things. But he didn't have a lot of the things that we have. And he was telling Saul that the bear lion come and took the lamb. My responsibility is to take care of and stand for that lamb. No matter what happens, my family's counting on me to take care of my responsibilities. And all of a sudden, then he goes and takes after the bear or the lion. And I want you to understand something here. When he explains to Saul that he takes the beard of the bear, that's pretty close. I'm assuming he's got a little slive on him. He's feeling the heat of the, the bear. And if you look in a bear's mouth, which you have to be if you've got it by the beard, you're in a serious situation here. And David said, no, that was hard. But I'm going to tell you something. God allowed me to be put in that situation because that was my training grounds. That was my training grounds. This is your training grounds, guys. When we're into the Word of God, but that was my training grounds. And now I'm going to show you that God is, God is, He's alive. And I'm okay to go after this Philistine because of what I have gone through in my lifetime to be trained. And. That's been very convicting for me because I look over my life and I realize that there's been things in my life that I've gone through that was hard, very, very painful. Things that I had no say about it. But that's why I am where I'm at because God has allowed that to happen because that gives me an opportunity to minister to other people that have been in that situation, that has gone through things, that you understand because somebody else may not understand because they haven't been through it. And there's things that each of you have gone through that I don't understand. We all are here to help each other, encourage each other, and grow. And that to me a while back it says if you think the price of winning is too high wait until you get the bill of regret and I realize that as I'm I'm preparing myself for life I can spend my whole life making excuses well I wasn't good in school I'm not a great reader I'm definitely not a great speller I mean it's a joke in our family that I ask Olivia how to spell something and because it's not something I'm strong at But I'm, at, I'm just reminding you, the training that David went through wasn't easy, but it prepared him for, the, for things when it was time to get real. And then in verse 38 through 39, 
So Saul clothed David with his armor, and he put a bronze helmet on his head, and he also clothed him with a coat of mail. David fastened his sword to his armor and tried to talk and tried to walk. Didn't work. He was that wasn't David. David was a not. But then he goes on, and what I Fred actually saw me go out and pick up these five stones. Because one of the things that fascinates me about it is a slingshot and a stone. Yeah, you can do a lot of things with it. And obviously he was very efficient with it. But he he was well trained by out in the field. And as we're going through, oh, I, I guess I do need to hurry. Um, as, he went, as he was going through, he goes down and picks up the five stones. And he takes those five stones, puts them in his pouch. And there was a, I, I call it trash talk between he and Goliath. But they were, and then finally said, David said, no, you are defying my God and your mind in the name of God. And the part that fascinates me is he didn't go up there sheepishly. He takes off running. He takes off running at Goliath as he's taking the stone out, putting the slingshot, slings it, drops him in his tracks. God won. God won. And, and so I, I, do, I know I need to hurry a little bit, but my first point really is a real man resists being passive. A real man resists being passive. And that's something that I want to encourage each of you is don't be passive. Then my second point, real men engage with God. And this is the part why this is so important. It's if you go back to Genesis 2.15... Who did God tell about the garden? He told Adam. He told Adam, do not eat it. Do you see anywhere where it says, don't touch it? Don't go around it. Don't do this. Don't do that. God said, don't eat it. And then you go to the next chapter and where the discussion between Eve, did God really say, don't touch it? or don't eat it, don't do this, and don't do that. And Adam stood there. The value of knowing the truth of the word of God is crucial and important to be a man of your household. It is crucial to study, to show thyself approved. It is crucial we, we educate ourselves in our jobs, which is temporary. But are we educating ourselves in the area that is eternal? And that's the part that baffles me because I realize so much of my life that I have been passive in that area. Um, and then I jump over to 2 Timothy 3.16. Timothy 3.16. I had to use my cheat tabs because... Number one, my eyes aren't very good anymore. Um, 3, 16 through 17. But shun, pro oh, wait, did I say? Oh, I got to look at the right chapter. Um, All scripture is given by inspiration of God and is profitable for doctrine, for reproof, for correction, for instruction in righteousness. And the man of God may be complete, thoroughly equipped for every good work. Doesn't say some of the scripture, says all of it. And it's important for us to study, to teach and learn, because you may not be up here, but you are in front of your family. You are in front of somebody. And then... Um, this is one of my, we were, we've been watching, what's the, what's the show? The Chosen. And one of my favorite things about it is, is seeing the miracles. I've really enjoyed seeing the miracles because 
I've, I've heard both sides, but yet I've seen the miracles. And one of the things that the other night I saw this one in John 4, 13 through 14. Um, uh, let me see here. And Jesus set, answered and said to her, whoever drinks of this water will thirst again, but whoever drinks of the living water that I shall give him will never thirst. But the water that I shall give him will become in him a fountain of water springing up into everlasting life. And you know, one of the things that, yes, I just said something a minute ago about so many things that as men we invest our time and our efforts in is temporary. There's going to be a day that either you're going to die or you're going to retire, right? But what are you doing now that is actually a part of the eternal. The living water that Jesus is telling this woman about, it replenishes. It's always fresh. It's always growing. It's always, it's, it's refreshing. And as humans, we tend to fill ourselves with things that are not going to bring satisfaction. You know, I, I'm going through a situation where every truck I own right now has been a headache. And I keep thinking, boy, it sure be nice to have something new. Yeah, whatever. We get caught up in things. But what's our true investments? Is it eternal? Is it part of the living water? And then I, I'm going to jump down. The third point is a real man accepts responsibility. And... person why I'm not happy. I always want to blame everybody else around me. They're not fulfilling what I need in order to be happy. And I want to have you jump over to Ephesians um, 6. Um, there it is. Um, Ephesians in chapter 5 verse 25 is a husband love your wives just as Christ also loved the church and he gave himself for her that's pretty straightforward isn't it it didn't say if you felt like it it said love your wives sacrificially all the way without question be willing to give your life for her in life or in death why often so often we've been taught that we're sacrificial as oh we'll die for her Probably not. If we're not going to live for her, we're probably not going to die for her, right? And that's something that's been a challenge for me in my own life. Am I willing to live for her? Am I willing to die for her? And then you, I want you to jump down to um, Ephesians 6, 1 through 4, and it says, um, Children, obey your parents in the Lord, for this is right. Honor your father and mother, which is the first commandment um, with promise, that it may be well with you, and may live long on the earth. And you know, that's the verse we always want to go to, don't we? As parents, hey, listen to me. But catch the next part here. Part that gets to me, okay? And you fathers, do not pro- provoke your children to wrath. but bring them up in the training. And the other, I also saw where it says um, nurture tenderly. I always think about, I'm feeding these, land, these calves and bottle feeding these calves. I don't just beat them around, but I take time and teach them how to drink from the bottle. I take time to teach them how to drink from the, the bucket. I, I, it's nurturing. It's kind, and that's what, as a man, I'm straight to the point. I get to the point, I, I'm, I'm abrupt. I'm, no. Don't provoke your children to death. Don't get angry. Don't get a yelling match. Don't get nasty. But take them to the word of God. It's not about an ego trip, but it's about, I call it an altar trip. Because we're coming back to the altar together and saying, you know what? 
we need to get out and things out because this and my girls have seen me apologize I feel like I'm kind of the prodigal father that's always back and forth but um, but the husband and then jump over to um, and if Psalms 127 in Psalms 127 um, it one of the things it, it in verse 1 um, I was debating on having people read and I figured you guys probably don't want that um, but the Lord has to build the house unless if he doesn't then it's in vain but if you jump down below there one of the things that I have realized that'd make a pretty bad arrow wouldn't it right that makes a pretty bad arrow and I realized when it talks about later in the chapter there it talks about a quiver full of arrows and and in a in a marksmanship or or a warrior that you want something that's a fit that's done right you raise you you put an arrow to Everything, everything has to be lined up, and the time that goes into making sure that arrow is ready for flight, it takes teaching, and it takes effort from the archer. Dad, you're the archer. You're part of that archer. You're the person who's preparing that arrow for flight, and that's the part that has been very convicting to me. not to be passive be self-controlled do not be angry and I, and I need to wrap up here and the last one is lead courageously because one of the things that as David did he trained and he came into the camp he did put questions in their minds why aren't you doing something about this and he led courageously and as, as I see David and I see my life, David had his flaws. I, I know that. But there's a lot of great examples for men in this part of the passage about David's life because he was, he was a warrior. He, he did not allow somebody to defy God. He stood, and he stood firm. This is my last seven me this week I shared with pastor this week and it says maturity is when you stop complaining and making excuses and start making changes and my prayer for as men in this church no excuses no complaining just make changes we work together the unity of the body of Christ we are strong together and we grow together Let's pray. Our gracious Heavenly Father, I just want to thank you for being the amazing, awesome God that you are, Lord. God, I just want to thank you for your patience with me. And I want to thank you for the, the opportunities that you have given me, the mercy that you have given me, and never given up on me. And I know everybody in this room can feel the same way about them, Lord. God, I just want to pray that you bring us as a church, unite us so that way we can impact and change the world and change our community around us. In him I pray, amen. Will you stand as we close?